Thank you for checking out our YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe and like. And please visit us at barrykibrick.com where you'll see all the ways that you can become a patron of our mission and help us continue to build a community of seekers who quest for knowledge, information, and most importantly, wisdom. What if everything we believed about consciousness was actually the opposite? Hi, I'm Barry Kibrick, and my guest, Mark Gober, believes it is exactly that way. In our conversation about his book, An End to Upside Down Thinking, we'll explore compelling scientific evidence that may shake up reality as we know it. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses, from podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more, with tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com. Mark, it's a pleasure to have you here on Between the Lines. I find this subject matter fascinating, so welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Well, I'm going to start with your words because there's no better way because this is how you open up the book. Before you begin reading, I warn you that you might need to suspend everything you thought you knew about reality. That's a major statement to start off with, which, of course, drew me in, and then it's absolutely true. So fill me in, brother. Well, I wanted to start that way to remind people to open up and to, to warn the reader that the things that we typically perceive with our ordinary senses, like our eyes and our ears, show us just a sliver of reality. And when we look into the nature of reality beyond the ordinary senses, there are many counterintuitive things that we find. So that's the way I started it, was to really prime the reader with that <laughs> understanding. And I think the next sentence, or maybe a few sentences later, is a reminder that there's so much we don't know about the universe. And even in science, the physicists will say there's 96% of the universe, roughly, that is unknown dark energy and dark matter, meaning we know that it exists, but we don't know what it is. Most of the universe is an unknown entity. And we're going to start exploring that now. And in fact, one of the things that you yourself did, because what I found interesting is, and I think this is, is key, you're literally a layman, so to speak. In other words, you are not a physicist or a neuroscientist, but you are an educated man, and you took upon this as a passion. This was a true passion for you to investigate more about our consciousness. And what you talk about, though, is one of the things that we're missing nowadays is you really need to be multidisciplinarian, so to speak. You really, in, in, as we used to be, you need to be a scientist, an artist, a philosopher. It, we're, we're in silos nowadays, and those silos are keeping us from really learning about all of that stuff that's out there that we don't really know about. Absolutely, and I think that the, the lack of multidisciplinary education, I'll say, is holding us back in many ways in science. And one example is in the areas of, of physics. The physicists deal with physical matter. And it's possible, and this is what I suggest in the book, that there are non-physical influences, such as consciousness, which is typically something that philosophers or psychologists look at. As physicists will say, consciousness isn't something for me. And even Stephen Hawking has said he gets uneasy when people, especially theoretical physicists, talk about consciousness. Well, two things, though. I had Leonard Mladenov on my show, who wrote The Grand Design with Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, when you press them, and, and the same thing happens with, a, a, I had told you a, earlier in the green room about Gerald Schroeder, you press them, and it, even Leonard Susskind, one of the great physicists of the, of the black hole theory, when you press them and say, is there something that might transcend they cannot deny. That's the one thing they can't do. They cannot deny that something may transcend. They may want to say, I'm not using that as part of my discipline, but that's why the multidiscipline needs to be brought back in. Absolutely. 
and even in the area of medicine, for example. Uh, the medical education system right now is very much based on the Newtonian paradigm, which is kind of the common sense reality we live in. You drop an apple, it falls to the ground because of gravity. And Newtonian physics does a very good job of approximating reality. However, for the last hundred plus years, we now know there is a quantum reality that defies common sense, works at the very, very ultra small scale, and that's not integrated into much of our medicine, for example, or some of the other disciplines that work in the, the everyday experience world. Well, you know, I had on uh, privilege to have on Neil deGrasse Tyson about his most recent book uh, um, for physics, for uh, astrophysics for people in a hurry. And he too noticed, because he's, he's a massive guy that's into the periodic table. And I said, well, wait, that's kind of interesting for an astrophysicist to be. And he says, you have to be, because you don't know what the chemicals are doing. And this is the same thing here. If we don't know what the chemical reactions are, if we don't know what the electronic or frequency reactions are, if we don't know what the quantum mechanics are, or the astro, the, the large physical bodies, or whether we know the great forces or the low, if we're not really familiar with those in an interdisciplinary manner, we are missing stuff. There's just no two ways about it. Absolutely. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book was to introduce multidisciplinary concepts to provide, I think, a more comprehensive picture of reality than is currently taught in an effort to hopefully promote uh, progress in science and medicine and beyond. Now, you, you, you state in the beginning, too, that we are basing most of our physics and things like that on materialism, what is known as m the matter itself that you see. And as you mentioned, the reality of it is is that 96% plus matter we don't see. There is nothing, we, we know there's something there, like you say, it's dark matter, it's dark energy, but we don't see it. The other thing that's so amazing is, and, and this is the hardest thing for, I believe, all of humanity to grasp, is that there's nothing solid. Hmm. That 99, as you say, 0.99, and you can run the nines down as far as you want, percent of everything is nothingness. So if you looked at an atom, as you said, the nucleus of an atom, which we can't get much smaller than an atom, but the nucleus of an atom is so far away from its electrons and protons that it would look like an ant on a football field. And therefore, our bodies themselves have mostly empty space. It's a concept like you said, that is counterintuitive because we feel so solid. Exactly, and it's another example of the reality that we're in is not one that conforms to our common sense. And yet our, our society really, especially in the West, is based on this notion of materialism, which says that the universe is fundamentally made of physical stuff called matter, which as you just described is mostly empty space. And it's from physical matter that began with the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, filling the universe with this matter. Uh, we end up with a biological organism that develops a brain and consciousness comes out. Now, that's what this book is all about, is that consciousness. And as you say, that led us to this awareness called consciousness. But, and why it's called an, up, an end to upside down thinking, we for the longest time believed that it was our brain that caused this consciousness and that's now where a lot of physics is telling us it may not be the brain creating the consciousness but that the brain is picking up as a receiver consciousness. That's a scary thing for people to grasp. It is a world-changing idea and it was life-changing for me when I first learned of these ideas about two years ago. Um, I, my, my education is, is very traditional. I studied psychology at Princeton. I've worked in the investment banking business consulting area for over 10 years. Um, and I learned of phenomena that challenge this assumption about where consciousness comes from. And if you had asked me two years ago or even in my psychology days, it wasn't something that we even looked at, whether consciousness comes from the brain. I th there's just kind of this underlying assumption that, oh, the reason that I'm conscious, the reason that I'm having an, a subjective inner experience right now that's speaking with you, that I can't touch, it's not physical, but it's there, that's just due to chemical reactions in my brain. There's something complex going on in here, and then out comes my mind, my consciousness. 
I never even thought to question it. I didn't know it was a question. But when I got into the research, I realized that actually Science Magazine, a very reputable scientific outlet, has called this the number two question that remains in all of science. As they put it, what is the biological basis of consciousness? Science is asking the question how physical biology creates consciousness. So if there's one thing I think readers hopefully will take away from the book is that, number one, there is a big question about where our own consciousness comes from. And it's such a fundamental thing to our existence. I mean, we can send people to the moon, we can genetically modify organisms, and yet we still don't know the origin of our own consciousness. One of the physicists who brought this out, and uh, you bring him out in the book, is Max Planck. He was basically, it's, it's, very, it's kind of a funny story that I, I'm familiar with, and I'll, I'll share with our viewers right now. But in a sense, really, Einstein is the father of quantum physics. It's just that he believed it's so impossible, he refused to believe that his thoughts would be leading to quantum physics. He just hated it so much because he, he couldn't really understand that as, quote, you know, God has the term he said, doesn't play with dice. He believed everything was ordered. But his co-physicist, Max Planck, really then becomes the father of quantum mechanics because he says, and these are his words, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. That has to be what you're, where you got at least the, the primal thought of what was now changing, because that's what this book is all about. It's saying, wait a minute, it's not the matter that's created, it's not in here that's creating consciousness, it's out there that's creating the matter. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and that's why the book is called An End to Upside Down Thinking. I now regard materialism, matter creates consciousness, as having it upside down, that consciousness instead is primary in the universe, existing beyond space and time, and the physical world that we're in, including our bodies, are experiences within consciousness. So it puts our own consciousness at a more central place in the universe. Rather than saying there was a universe that ultimately spawned a human being, this is saying the human being is central, or the consci conscious beings are central, and the physical world is an experience within us. And there's, there's a bit of a religious aspect to this, even though it's never mentioned in the book, but you can't help but if something is transcending the material, it's transcendent, yeah. and therefore it implies things. But I had on my show, and someone you brought in, Sam Harris. And Sam Harris, as he said to me, he said, my atheistic credentials cannot be denied. However, he is a deep believer that also consciousness is coming from somewhere else. And I'll, I'll, I'll use the words that, that you picked out from him. He says, there is nothing about a brain, because he is a neuroscientist, studied at any scale that even suggests that it might harbor consciousness. So we almost have to upside down even think what religion is, what transcendence is, because this is now putting a spin on it in, in a very unique way. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say my own personal belief before I became exposed to this material was very much, um, I would say, kind of against religious beliefs because I wanted to have scientific evidence to back my view of reality. And now what I've come to through the scientific exploration is that many of what the mystical traditions have been saying for a very long time conform to this notion that consciousness is in a primary role. So it has inadvertently taken me in, in the direction of what mystical traditions have said, although the book is very scientifically focused. But yet you're aware of what happens. I'll read your words again. If consciousness really does exist outside the brain, then science would need to shift its paradigms. Because that now all of a sudden, and, and I can tell you for a fact, if that happens, and it, uh, I had on a wonderful man, Dr. Buckberg, who said these great words. He says, the truth will always win out, but only God knows when. And this is the same thing. The truth, if this is the truth, and even you'll admit we don't, can't, we can't prove it either way, right. but that paradigm shift for science, it may take a while for that to happen. And I don't know if it will speed up because of this book or not, but it, it, it will take a while. It just, it's brutal to change you know, paradigms. It's just it's impossible because people, it's ingrained as, as, as their being. 
Yeah, absolutely. But I think we'll all benefit if science can adjust. I mean, there are many diseases, for example, in the medical field that have not been, they haven't been solved yet. There are many technological developments that we haven't seen. And to me, one of the big missing pieces is this understanding and recontextualizing of consciousness as not something that's just a byproduct of the brain that has no effect on the physical world, but rather something that is primary and has a very measurable physical effect on the world. And therefore, all of our equations in in science need to account for this other factor that currently science is ignoring. Well, two things. You say even the fact of, what is it, 60% of everything now that we use is based on this quantum theories, which, by the way, throw everything upside down. We don't even know. We literally, we know how to engineer them. We know how to manufacture them. But if you ask many of the engineers and the scientists, they'll say, I really don't know how it's working, but we know from quantum physics that this does work. It's an amazing, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing universe right now that we're living in. Yeah, we're using quantum physics, but understanding how it works and how our place in the universe fits in is not well understood. And, and some of the, the ideas in quantum physics, which are totally mind-blowing, but which I think are very important because they're not taught regularly, or maybe they're taught in a physics class as something kind of esoteric, but this is the reality we're in. Something known as entanglement, where two particles, two physical pieces of matter that are physically distant, if you affect one, the other one is affected simultaneously and instantaneously. That's a simplification. But it implies that there is some hidden connection between two things that are distant that we're not seeing. And Albert Einstein called that spooky. I was just going to say, that's what I, my next line was, spooky at a distance. That's what it is, because it's spooky. And then again, because it's spooky, sometimes you just say, ah, get it out of the way. But you're saying, no, 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 it's that spooky part we've got to look at. Right. I think looking at the anomalies, is, it's a critical thing to do. I think we're at the same point in science, where there are anomalies of consciousness that once we incorporate, will revolutionize everything. By the way, you also, though, make this statement, and very emphatically, I believe, there is still a strong correlation between brain activity and conscious experience. So it's not, it's revolutionary, but it still is somehow taking place within what we will call the matter of our brain and mind, even though the consciousness may not be there, how we're interacting, how we're receiving the consciousness still if anything, it may be, as I, I told you about Gerald Schroeder before, what a, a, who, who began studying this a, a while ago out at the, uh, he's from MIT originally, and then he's uh, out of Israel now, and he said that even if the brain is a receiver, and he used this wonderful example, he said, picture a radio, and he said, there's nothing there. You got the antenna coming down, but there's nothing between that antenna. If that radio is smashed, that music is still there, it's just not being picked up. So in a sense, I looked at that when I heard that as maybe the brain is the receiver that picks up consciousness. Yeah, that's a really critical point, Barry. And I, I think your viewers might be asking themselves, well, isn't the brain involved in consciousness? And we do know the brain's involved. And that, that might be the big mistake that we'll look back in history and say, I can't believe they thought that. And the mistake potentially is to assume that because the brain is related to consciousness, because there's a strong correlation between the, the way our brain behaves and the type of conscious experience we have, that it must be the case that the brain produces consciousness. So for example, someone gets in a car accident and that person has uh, memory impairments or they can't see as well. We can see brain damage, change in conscious experience. The problem with assuming that because the brain's related to consciousness, that the brain must somehow produce it is known in statistics as correlation does not imply causation. So a very simple example. If we think of a fire, many firefighters show up. A larger fire, more firefighters show up at the scene. Do we presume that the firefighters caused the fire just because there's a correlation? No, we don't in that instance. So we know there's a relationship between the two things, but it's not causal. And what we might have here is something similar. There's a relationship between the brain and consciousness. The brain processes consciousness, but it's not the producer. And here's where I want to get into a, a little bit with you off script even here. And that is that if consciousness is outside of the brain, and let's say we're, we're, we're all going to play this game, because I, I wouldn't have you on here if I didn't obviously 
kind of believe this, okay? And I say kind of because, again, how do we prove this? But it's just as hard to prove the other, so it doesn't mm -hmm. matter at this point. Are we, because of the, I guess, what we would call limitless frequencies, let's say we use the term frequency as if it was like an FM receiver, the one thing that you kind of leave us with a little mystery here, is it one consciousness that we're all receiving at our own wavelength, or are those consciousnesses, quote, mm -hmm. out there at their own wavelengths? I'm curious where you got, because I even had trouble, I, I had a sense where you got, but I, I had trouble with that one a little bit. Yeah, so the, there is uh, a quote from Schrodinger, the famous physicist, who said, in truth, there's only one mind. And That's the part I had a little trouble right, with. Right, so the no notion that we are part of a singular consciousness having some kind of diversity of experience, and there's an interconnectedness of consciousness, an entanglement, perhaps. Um, so I think, to me, where the research and the science points is in that direction, so I'm most persuaded by that idea currently, that it's a singular consciousness at the most fundamental level. And there's an analogy that I mentioned in the book uh, from B Dr. Bernardo Castrup, who says, imagine that reality is like a stream of water, where water represents consciousness. And each of us is like a little whirlpool, a localization of water of consciousness. So we're part of the same stream, but we're having localized, individualized experiences. And that to me is, that's a, an analogy that I think uh, math, math fits the data very well. I must tell you, I do sincerely know, and I'll say this, it's a fact, that consciousness does not die when the physical body dies. And that's physics. It's a form of energy. It cannot die. It must be somewhere where I'm not sure yet but it must be somewhere yeah that's where I come out too I mean if consciousness is not produced by the brain and can exist independently of the body then the death of the physical body would not imply the death of consciousness but I'll tell you two <laughs> quick stories uh, one you use is by uh, Elizabeth uh, oh who is it the great oh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross mm -hmm. and the one is that I had on a, a fellow on my show John O'Donoghue who both of them almost state the exact same thing, so I'll just read it. Uh, it's really a transition that's happening. And I think one of the great films that I love is Defending Your Life. And that's where Albert Books dies, and he's going through the transition, and you see him reviewing his life, mm -hmm. and he's got to defend it. And it's, it's, it's a hilarious film. It's one of the great films of all time. I think one of the most underrated films. But it's the exact same thing that Kubler-Ross says. A transition to a higher state. I may say maybe it's a different state. Who knows if it's higher? That's subjective. Right. But a higher state of consciousness. Yeah, that's certainly what's described by people who have a near-death experience when it's hard to explain what they're going through by way of brain activity. So it's a window into what might happen after death. It's the best, maybe the best window we have. And those people come back not fearing death very often and viewing death more as a transition of consciousness rather than an end. Well, John O'Donoghue actually said it as figuring it almost like it's birth because when you're in the womb, you have no quote, idea of what's anything but in the womb. Then you're sucked out almost instantly, and now you are in a completely different universe or a state of consciousness. So he thinks that death is very similar to birth, where you're all of a sudden plucked out of where you were, and now you got to experience something all over again. Now, I don't know, again, we don't know how that experience takes place, but he had that same exact thought like it was a reverse process almost. Mm -hmm. And we see the stories of this in the ancient texts, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they talk about this phenomenon, but it's become more prevalent in the last few decades because of advances in resuscitation technology. We're bringing more people back from the dead and more people are reporting this. Well, I'm going to end with these. <laughs> chapter 13, which is the last chapter, and what I made a note is it's very funny. In the last chapter, you have two mini chapters within it that both begin with, I'm still confused. And I think that's probably what everyone is, but you know what? Mark, I think we're supposed to be confused about it. I think that's the spiritual quest that we have to be on. I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Thanks Thank so much, you, Barry. Mark.
my pleasure. And thank you for joining us. As I discussed, remember immediately following this episode, you can catch our afterwards featured exclusively online by visiting barrykibrick.com. And as I said, this time Mark and I will discuss how this new understanding of consciousness will reflect in our everyday lives, especially when it comes to life after death. But before that, I'd like to leave you with these words from an end to upside down thinking. Given the state of affairs in the world today, it seems that there is no more important study than the study of consciousness. For the sake of science, technology, medicine, business, education, ethics, and politics, and for the sake of humanity. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between the state of affairs in the world today and creating a greater path towards the future, it will require all of our consciousness to make sure we act for the best of humanity. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Barry. My pleasure. To become part of the Between the Lines family, go to barrykibrick.com. There you can join our book club, participate in Q&As, catch past episodes, listen to Barry's podcasts, read his blog, and experience exclusive online features, all at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Patreon. Patreon helps creators build and run membership businesses. From podcasters to writers, musicians, artists, and more. With tools that allow their fans to become patrons. More information is available at patreon.com.